Our next guest is Rick Stengel joining us here in the studio, who you know as a frequent guest on this network from Morning Joe to the 11th hour. You may know him as a former Undersecretary of State in the Obama administration and as the former editor of Time magazine, but Nelson Mandela knew him as a friend and co-author. The subtext of so many of my questions was, how did you become the way you are? What made you Nelson Mandela? Sometimes I asked him this directly. Do you feel that you came out a stronger man after all those years in prison than you were when you went into prison? As far as I'm concerned, I have come back with the same views I had before I went to jail and with the same enthusiasm for my political work. That is from episode 10 of Rick Stengel's new podcast series called Mandela, The Lost Tapes. Uh, Rick, this is 30 years ago in South Africa. Uh, I remember when you went over there to work with Nelson Mandela on his book, Long Walk to Freedom. What I didn't know is that I knew you were making all these tapes, but you never listened to them before. You just worked from the transcripts. Right. So you know how it works. You interview somebody, you have the transcript made, and when you're at your computer, you're reading the transcript. But you had Nelson Mandela on <laughs> tape. How could you not listen to it for what? Now, 30 years? Or you just listened to it this year? I guess I'd forgotten about it. I mean, uh, you know, I remember the book and, and remember being with him, and I was in that room, and... Only when I realized it's the 10th anniversary of his death, there's going to be a lot of documentaries that I think, wow, this is make a fantastic podcast. Yeah. And so you've got uh, 10 episodes of it. I want to listen to a little bit more uh, from the podcast of you describing how you work together. Let's listen to this. Mandela and Winnie got in a car to be driven to Cape Town, where he was scheduled to give his first public speech in decades. But there were many more people at the prison than they expected. The men and women in the crowd were excited. Some of them may have had a little too much mkumboti, a traditional South African beer brewed from corn. They surrounded the car, and it was a very anxious moment. They were climbing on the car, knocking at the door, at the window, demanding that we should open, I should come out. When I hear him say anxious moment, uh, he, he, is, he is just the prince of understatement in these things when it comes to suffering, when it comes to the danger that he experienced. Yes. You know, I, I once asked him, he had said to me many times, I was afraid when this happened. I was afraid I was going to be hit. And I said to him stupidly, you're Nelson Mandela. How could you be afraid? And he said, it would be irrational not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. He never had any... Um, problem admitting when he was wrong, admitting when he was nervous, admitting when he was scared. I mean, it was kind of, that's a, that's a huge strength. Let's listen to more. Let's listen to uh, the way you would, you would show up early in the morning and work together. Let's listen to that part. I would meet Mandela several times a week, almost always in the morning, 6.30 or 7 a.m. He was an early riser. He would wake up at 4 or 5 a.m. We would meet in his office in the city, or in his home in the suburbs, and a few times at his house in the Transkai, the rural area where he grew up. He'd often take tea and breakfast while we talked. This is the only time I take sugar, something sweet, like jam. I rely on this sugar. Are you sure you don't want uh, some jam? You didn't have the jam? I didn't have the jam. I don't like jam. But you see... He's incredibly gracious. He's a gentleman. He's an African aristocrat. And so one of the things, because this was 1993, long before podcasts, long before digital recorders, everything was captured in that room. People coming in and out and chatting with them, making jokes. I mean, you get a real sense of what he's like as a person. Yeah, because you, you were basically living with him. So people got used to you the way they get used to, say, Pete Souza, the White House photographer. Pete Souza talks about... Uh, getting the feeling that they don't, they really weren't thinking about him being there. And you had that feeling there, too. I, I, in a way, I felt like his mascot, almost. Yeah. I said to him, you know, I just want to hang with you, whatever, whatever you're doing. And he said, fine. And, and that was it. But a lot of times, people didn't know what I was doing there. Um, and a lot of times, people used me to get through to Mandela because they knew I was spending all this time with him. And uh, how did your view of him change? I mean, I, I would imagine on first meeting, it could be quite imposing. Yes, he's an incredibly impressive man. He's six foot two. He's handsome and beautiful and, and, and a little 
awe-inspiring. Mm -hmm. But as you get to know him, he's incredibly warm and sunny, and he makes every effort to be kind of ingratiating. I mean, he's a very, he was a very hard man, but he was a very gracious man. What do you think uh, were, were the, the key characteristics that got him through his life? The key characteristic that got him through his life was this unfailing focus on wanting to win democracy for his people. And he was a different man who went into prison. He described himself as tempestuous and passionate. Prison was like a crucible that wore away anything extraneous about his character, gave him incredible self-control and focus. So that man who walked out in 1990 was different than the man who walked in. In fact, in the earlier, when we were playing that episode of me asking him, how are you different? He avoided answering that question. And one day he said, I came out mature. Mm. That word meant a lot to him. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things I love about about this tea ritual in the morning <laughs> is that you do in this podcast, you feel like you're in his home having breakfast with him. You feel like you're having tea with him thanks to the audio. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there was no one else in the world in that room. Many people would have wanted to be in that room. Now millions of people can be in that room with the two of us. And, it, and it's a lovely feeling. I have to say, I, I miss that room when I left it. Oh, I would. I'm sure. And I, I, you miss it in the podcast when you when you you, you don't want this. This is one you don't want to end. I, I agree. I mean, he 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 has this amazing focus, but he also has a kind of charm that that makes everybody want to kind of be with him and love him. He once said to me, many people love me from afar, but very few from up close. I had the chance to love him from up close. Um, Audible, is that where we find Audible, us? only on Audible. Okay, Rick Stengel, thank you for doing this. Thank you for sharing the tapes. Thank you for being with us tonight.